Welcome back, everybody, and we have finally made it. We are here in Unit 10. Unit 10 is a long journey through another branch of calculus about infinite series. But before we get too deep into the idea of series, we're going to talk about this topic 10.1, which is entitled Defining in, uh, Convergence and, and Divergent Infinite Series. But we're going to talk a little bit about the building blocks of a series, which is a sequence. And so I want to take care of that first. So introducing sequences, mostly focusing on the explicit formula. So let's take a look. So here is our title screen for Unit 10. And as I read before or said before, the defining convergent and divergent infinite series is really the goal of this topic. And we'll get into the idea of the series, oh, after we talk about a few of these introductory videos here first. But if we go to the idea of sequence, what really is a sequence here? Well, if you consider the following list of numbers, 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16. I want you to think about how that list is generated. Because this list, as it says, is it's just an example of a sequence. It's just simply a listing of numbers that are separated by commas. And each one of these numbers in this sequence would be called a term. We can define this sequence really a variety of ways and use a variety of notation. As you see here, the most popular are just using these generic A's for the terms themselves and the subscripted numbers 1, 2, 3 to denote the term. I've often seen terms written or series or sequences, I'm sorry, written like this. Notice they both have the bracket notation in common. But what we're going to do more often than not is probably just simply refer to the sequence as a sub n. Sometimes we'll put the braces um, around it here, and sometimes we won't put those braces around it, uh, just out of basically convenience. But we have to realize that we are talking about a sequence when we see this a subscript n. And that subscript is actually called an index, very similar to the index that you saw with your summation expressions. A sequence often starts with an index of n equal 1, but it doesn't have to. They can sometimes start with 0, and I know that can get a little confusing. So that's sort of your basic building blocks of the notation. Now, there are two ways to define a sequence, as you can see in this table. On the left side, we've got our good friend, the recursive definition. Sometimes we call that the implicit definition. And on the right side, we have the explicit. Let's look at the recursive definition. It says, note that each term in the sequence is three more than the preceding term. So if you refer back to our sequence, which I know we don't have anymore, but in case you forgot, I'll remind you. It was 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, etc. So as you can see, each term is indeed three more than the term before it. So what you could do is you could just call a1 equal to 1, which indeed it is, and then just say your next term a2 is a1 plus 3. A3 would be A2 plus 3, and so on and so on, until you get to this place here where you could say that the nth plus 1 term is just the term before it, which is the nth term plus 3. And I know that this is kind of some wacky notation, a different way to think about things, but trust me, you're going to see that a lot. So you want to get used to the nth term is always followed by the nth plus 1 term. Now, if you put this all together very formally, you can write this. And that would definitely convey this recursive definition. You wouldn't necessarily have to include this part I'm highlighting in green. And the reason is because it's typically understood that you're going to use counting numbers of n equal 1, 2, and 3. Now, if we look over at the explicit definition, we look at this in a little different light, and you notice that each term in the sequence can be represented by ordered pairs. So you could use the order of the term as like the x-coordinate, and the actual value of the term could be the y-coordinate. So therefore, 1, 1, 2, and I believe we have a little typo that I'm going to fix. Let's call this a 4, you guys. So we have 1, 1. 2, 4, 3, 7, 4, 10, 
etc., etc. Those would serve as the ordered pairs for this relationship. And note that little typo there, that four should be coming from here. Otherwise, this wouldn't work very well. So what we do is we just use a, a known relationship about these ordered pairs that we like to call the point slope formula. So I can pick any two of these at random. So I'll pick the first two points and I take the difference of the y's over the difference of the x's. And I could also take the second and third one. Or I could take the third and the fourth one together, but as long as I subtract any two consecutive y's over x's, I'm going to get the same result. That's three, and that actually serves as the slope. And then you just pair that with whichever uh, point you want to use. I chose the first one, and boom, you've got your expression. Notice I use a n in place of the y, and I use n in place of the x. And so you get this nice explicit definition looks very different than the recursive. Well, which one's better? I have an answer to that, but let's see if you can kind of predict what I'm going to say. The benefit of the recursive is that it's very easy to find. It's probably going to be the easiest relationship that you've got going. But the drawback to recursive is that it's not very helpful if you want to find a term very deep into the sequence, like, say, the 50th term. We're just going to have to keep building this and building this because we probably need that 49th term. Now, the benefit of the explicit is that it will do a great job of figuring out what is the 50th term. You just enter 50 in for x for n, and I can tell you right now that the answer is 148. That's great. Now, the drawback is that this relationship can be a little bit difficult to see if the sequence is not so well behaved like it was in this one being linear or some of the ones that we're going to see very soon geometric now the one that i really want you to be good at is the explicit because that's the one that we're going to see a little bit more often in the course so we move on to our first official example here and it asks us to use the explicit formula for each given sequence, and you notice that notation a sub n, where n goes from 1 to infinity, to write out the first four terms. So that's all we're going to do. We're going to practice writing out some terms. So for problem number a, if a sub n is equal to 1 over 2 to the nth power, we just simply write a1, we let n be 1, 1 over 2 to the first, and you probably don't even have to write 2 to the first because you can see that that's going to be 1 half. There's your first answer. Now you let n be 2, and I think you guys can see where this is going. 1 over 2 squared is 1 fourth. If we let n be 3, of course, 1 over 2 cubed is going to be 1 eighth. And Notice I, I do suggest that we simplify. I want us to go ahead and power up that 2. And finally, 1 over 2 to the 4th is 1 16th. And those would serve as the first four terms. We don't have to do anything else. Trust me, we're going to do a lot more with some of these kinds of problems and analyze them. But for now, we're just listing the terms. Part B, I would say Part B, a little bit uh, more involved of an nth term expression. This is a pretty, pretty cool looking explicit formula. I would like for you to pause this video, list out those first four terms, check your answer with me in a second. All right, are we ready? A sub 1 is, well, you've got negative 1 to the first times 1 all over 1 squared plus 1. Now, when this is all simplified, some interesting things happen. This negative 1 to the nth power, where n is 1, is just going to stay negative. And then the top is still going to be a 1. Now, I can put that negative in the top, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to just put it out in front. And the denominator is going to be 1 squared plus 1, which is 2. So your first term should have been negative half. Now, if you try to type or enter 2 in for the n, we have negative 1 squared times 2 all over 2 squared plus 1. 
Now you're going to notice something very interesting here. Now the negative 1 squared is going to result in a positive 1 times our 2 is 2. So now this is going to be a positive term altogether, and the denominator is going to end up being 5. A3 begins as negative 1 to the third times 3 over 3 squared plus 1. And when you look closely at this, you find out that you are right back to a negative again. The 3 numerator stays, and then 3 squared plus 1 is going to be 10. And lastly, the fourth term. Negative 1 to the fourth times 4 all over 4 squared plus 1. Now the negative disappears once more because of the even exponent. 4 remains on top, and 4 squared plus 1 is 17. And so you see that we have this alternating pattern of signs, and that's going to be a very important type of series that you're going to see about midway through our first unit here in what we call 10A at Avon High School, the first half of unit 10. Very interesting pattern, 1 half, 2 fifths, 3 tenths, 4 seventeenths. That might be pretty hard to predict, and yep, that's what the ex explicit formula would be. That would be a pretty tough one to come up with. Luckily, we didn't have to go that direction. Now, one thing I'd like to share with you here is I have the sequences graphed for you, as you can see here. And I think what I might want to do is possibly extend this so I can move this down just a little bit so we can see. There we go. So the two sequences from example one would actually look like this if you sketch them on your graphing calculator. And I can share with you in a separate video how to do various calculator manipulations of sequences, whether you're using a TID4 or a TI Inspire. But if you take a look at the sequence 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, it definitely looks like these points just seem to get closer and closer to this x axis and continue to do so out to infinity. Whereas the series that we just worked on that goes from negative half to positive two-fifths to negative three-tenths to, well, I don't have it listed, but I can tell you right now that point right there has the n value of four, and it would have a y value of four-seventeenths, or an ace of n value of four-seventeenths is probably just a little smidge bigger than 0 0.2, uh, a little smaller that I should say, than 0.25, right? 4 sixteenths would be 0.25, so 4 seventeenths would be, I think, just a little bit smaller because it's got a bigger denominator. Now, we're going to really start looking at these very closely and talking about what do these points do? Where do they seem to want to go? That becomes the first question that we want to answer with our study of sequences and then ultimately series. Lots more videos planned for you. We want you to stick around for them. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time.